The story begins with a girl, that's me, and she grew up to be a scientist. She started out as a small girl living on a farm. And the story really begins before that with my parents, Machen Riccio. Machen Riccio, those aren't their original names. <laughs> they took, as you may imagine, they took on those names when they moved to go live with the hippies. They went off the grid in the early 1980s. And at that time, they had, over time, they had three children, my brother and my sister and me. And it wasn't always the easiest lifestyle, you can imagine. We lived in a 300 square foot yurt with a family of five. It's small. Um, we often didn't have electricity. We didn't have hot water. We had an outhouse. My dad built us a two-seater outhouse, so it was really the lap of luxury. No wall in between or anything. Um, and, you know, my dad chopped wood. Um, my parents had a button-making business. It occurred to them that one way to support the family was going to be able, was going to be by um, selling these clay buttons. You can imagine that's a, not an easy way to support a family of five. Um, it wasn't particularly lucrative. So, you know, at all. I mean, you probably bought a clay button once, but imagine trying to feed the family with that. Um, so, you know, it was a, there were ways in which we were not, we did not have a lot, but there were also ways in which we did have a lot. For example, I grew my own garden when I was five years old and planted flowers and spent time building fairy houses in the woods and playing with my brother and sister. And I was homeschooled. Um, people might call it unschooled today. A lot of my schooling was very um, non-traditional and atypical. And there was, a lot of, there was a lot of wealth in that experience, that close connection with the natural world. So you might be asking yourself, how does somebody go from hippie girl out in Oregon to college professor at UNC Greensboro? Well, I was fortunate that in 1992, I had the opportunity to attend Rogue Community College, which is a community college out in Oregon. I was 14 years old. Um, I had knobby knees and I wore a fanny pack and I had giant glasses and I had absolutely no idea what to do with college boys. Um, they didn't pay much attention to me, so it was fine. Um, and so there I was in college and it was really different than my experiences leading up to that. And one of the things that was really hard was word problems. I don't know if you guys have had the experience of trying to solve a word problem before, but my upbringing with the hippies did not entirely prepare me for <laughs> word problems. So I, I sat on my parents' bed many nights, many days in fact. I spent hours sometimes on one word problem. I would just be trying to say, okay, how do you get these words and convert them into an equation? How does that happen? And I kept trying to do that. And at first, it took me hours to do one problem, and then over time, I started to see something swimming into sense on that page. There became, began to be something about those words that actually did translate into equations. And by doing it over and over again, it started to make sense. And that was very helpful because eventually I was going to become a chemist. I'm a chemist, and a lot of chemistry is applied math, it's being able to take words and convert them into equations and then go back again. And that's something that is a little terrifying if you haven't had experience doing it. I introduced myself to someone tonight as a chemist, to Susan, who's lovely, and I got the normal response that I get, which is, oh, heaven help us, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, what, what do you mean you're a chemist? Um, I think, also, part of the reason I get that response of surprise when I introduce myself as a chemist is that I don't necessarily fit the image that people have when they think of what a chemist looks like. And we have told a story of chemistry over time that's been a story that is dominated by figures like Einstein and Newton. And it's all about crazy hair and lab coats. Um, <laughs> And so, and of course there's Marie Curie, right? There's Marie Curie, she's not a man. She won two Nobel Prizes um, in chemistry and physics and we like to talk about her a lot. But she's the exception that proves the rule, right? She is an anomaly. And I'm used to being that anomaly. 
Uh, I have been at conferences where I'm one of very few women many times, and I'm often the only woman speaker on a panel at a scientific conference. Um, I'm sitting on the scientific advisory board right now for a major multinational corporation, and I'm the only woman on the scientific advisory board. When I'm in the room with the top executives at the company and the top scientific group, there is not one African American in the room, except and maybe a few of the administrative assistants, and I know that that has nothing to do with ability. And that has, has everything to do with stories and the stories that we tell. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to tell you a slightly different version of my story. And that version of the story is not about a girl who didn't have financial resources and pulled herself up by her bootstraps. It's not about a girl whose parents were not, did not graduate from college and went to live on the land and, and somehow she became a chemist and that was her own hard work. There was some hard work involved, but it wasn't hard work that was done in a vacuum. It was hard work that was supported by a whole community of people. And some of those people were my parents and some were my grandparents. My grandmother, her name is Mildred L. Bennett, and she won the Mildred L. Bennett Award, actually, she won the Mildred L. Bennett Award for math teachers. It's called the Mildred L. Bennett Award because she's Mildred L. Bennett. <laughs> so why did she win and invent, no, not invent, being, why was this award, why was this award named after my grandmother? Well, my grandmother started a program where she would go into inner city Portland and she would teach math to poor kids by playing math games with them after school. And she did that every day. She was disabled. She uh, had diabetes and she couldn't walk very well, but she had a cart of her math games and she would carry it with her everywhere and she would bring that cart in and she would play math games with kids and she would teach them how to do math. And she of course taught my mother how to do math. She had four daughters and all four of her daughters were expected to be mathematicians and they certainly were all great at math. So when I was studying in my parents' bed, trying to figure out how to solve a math problem, my grandmother had taught my mother how to do math, and my mother was there to help me. So I wasn't struggling by myself. And in fact, I had another privilege that many people who are in college do not have, which was I had the opportunity to spend a whole day studying math. Who gets to do that? I didn't have to feed kids. I didn't have to pay the bills. I was a full-time student. Very few of my students get to be full-time students and not have to think about anything else. So that was a huge privilege for me to have that. Um, and I was really benefited, I benefited greatly from that. My father is a wonderful writer and probably one of the world's best botanists. He's completely self-taught botanist. He's amazing, well, well known for his work as a botanist. That's influenced greatly what I do. And he taught me how to write papers. So when I had to write a college paper, I had my dad helping me do that. So I'm really grateful for those opportunities and those privileges and that access that I had that allowed me to succeed, eventually to go from community college to a university, to go to graduate school, and to be able to get a PhD in chemistry and come here to UNC Greensboro, where I've been for almost 20 years. I came here when I was 23 years old as a brand new assistant professor. And it's been a wonderful privilege to teach at this university and to teach so many amazing students and people. And one of the things that I'm really grateful for is that opportunity to give back. And I'm really appreciative of the fact that all throughout my career, starting when I was a young child to from my parents my grandparents, my teachers at community college, my teachers at university, I had so many people who believed in me, who looked at me and never said, you're not good at math, even though I wasn't good at math initially. I really was not, I assure you. Um, but they continued to say, you can do this. You can totally do this. You've got this. And so I kept doing it until I became able to do it. And right now, what I hold very dear is the opportunity to mentor the next generation of scientists. And I wish I could show you, I don't mind doing this without my overheads, but the picture I wish I could show you is the picture of my students, because they are amazing. And they are all, they are just beautiful. <laughs> and they all look 
not like Einstein, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but it's, it's really uh, remarkable to think about how the pipeline for the future has changed dramatically and how the people that we will be seeing as our future scientists are not the people that we have had as our scientists in the past. And that is not to say that there's anything negative to be said about those great scientists. These are my friends, my colleagues. I've been mentored by men. Um, they have helped me to become who I am. And I love working with them. And every one of them would say, if you ask them, every one of my colleagues would say, we want to see more women in science. We want to see more people from underrepresented groups in science. Because we recognize that we as humans face a very challenging and uncertain future. And it's not really clear how we're going to continue to survive and thrive on this planet. And in order for us to do that, we have to have the creativity of everybody as part of that process. We need every single one of us to be involved. And that means that we need to bring as many people into science and technology as possible. We are in what we call the Anthropocene era right now, a time when the greatest impact on the planet is human beings. And that's a very big responsibility. So how do we continue to have an impact on the planet in a way that is sustainable and beneficial and ultimately lifts us all up? I'm often asked when it was that I decided to become a scientist. And I've thought about that question. And from time to time, I've thought maybe there was some moment of discovery that I made in the lab, or perhaps there was a particular teacher that made me want to become a chemist. Like, who decides to become a chemist? Why, why did I pick that? And I realized that as I've thought about this question, that there's different ways to think about science, but one of them is to think about science as a collective human activity, an activity that we've all been a part of and continue to be a part of as human beings. All of us as children were curious about the world around us. We asked why, why, why about everything. We explored, we tried to figure out the world, and really that's just all that science is. It's asking questions and being curious and trying to interpret and understand the world around us. And some of us do that in ways that involve very specific training, very highly technical training. I'm grateful to have had that training. I'm grateful to be able to give it to others. I'm hoping that we can make an impact on humanity by using those tools that we have gained. But I also want to acknowledge that when we ask those questions, we have to make sure we're asking the right questions, and that involves a dialogue with everyone. And I really want to welcome all of you into that dialogue. You're all scientists. You were all born curious about the world. You all continue to ask questions, and we want you to be part of that process. So we are not separate from each other. We are part of a long history, dating back to the ancient Chinese who figured out paper, the ancient Egyptians who, in whom we have the roots of botany, mathematics coming from India. All of that is the, the shoulders, the giants that we stand on today. And I, I am so honored to continue in that tradition and I welcome all of you to be a part of it.